Heading the housewives' food cut revolt, 300 women from Ilford, Barking and East Ham gather for a mass protest in Ilford Town Hall. The talking points for further argument came from the chairman, Mrs Watts. We're hoping and expecting that when the war was over that we should get more to eat. Yeah. At, at least not to have a cut. Yeah. I think probably we would have been content to have gone on. We wouldn't have said a word until things had righted themselves. But we feel that the Prime Minister has led us up the garden path. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Prime Minister and Sir Ben Smith might be very decent sort of chaps and we don't mind walking up the garden path with them. And here's what it all came to. A resolution put by Vice Chairman Miss Austin. This meeting demands from the government more food, greater value for points, more soap, and a separate issue of coupons to cover household linen, curtains, furnishings, etc. Food cuts agitation went a step further. Cue busting, clergyman's wife Mrs. Lovelock, spectacled chairman of the British Housewives League, led a deputation of three armed with a protest resolution to Whitehall and Food Minister Sir Ben Smith. But already Britain buckles down with sober determination to the work of keeping the nation fed. At Bedford, land girls march past Princess Elizabeth, a well-earned tribute to the food army, now facing a battle bigger even than its task in war. Women, assisting at the wheel of agriculture, drive forward to make the season's crop a bumper one. For a background of the all-out food drive, we come again to Westminster and the staggering news which rounded off the present session of UNO. In 35 days, 60,000 feet of film have recorded the scenes and deliberations of 51 nations and the warnings of world famine were no easy note to end on. I do not exaggerate the situation when I say it is really alarming. I'm aware that all of us like variety. And to eat our food in the form of meat, chicken, eggs, etc., is very nice to us. But when faced with famine, the whole value of the food eaten by the human is very important. We must have regard that the war is still on until we can beat the enemy of famine and so get our people back into a good nutritional standard. We shall remember also Edward Statinius, quiet-voiced, sincere, an old and tried friend of Britain. As for the United States, you may be certain that my government and the American people will join wholeheartedly in whatever measures are necessary and possible to win the war against starvation throughout the world. A heartwarming gesture is made by Australia's spokesman, Mr. Beasley, with this rallying call of the British Commonwealth of Nations. I shall not fail to inform my government of what has been said here today and yesterday. Both the government and the Australian people will contribute to whatever way they can to overcome the present shortage and to check the threat of famine. There's an element of drama as Dr. Wellington Koo rounds off China's claim for help with these arresting words. The problem of food is one vital to all humanity. The present acute shortage of cereals throughout the world, especially of wheat and rice, constitutes a critical situation which only the determined and concerted efforts of all governments and peoples can overcome. And for Russia, Monsieur Grumiko, in harmony on the topic of privation, the Soviet Union and 50 other nations agree on the solemn problem of this hungry world. Therefore, adequate measures for conserving food supplies and for ensuring maximum production of grain in the coming season should be taken. Characteristic, plain speaking, gesticulating Senator Tom Connolly, the voice of a world conscious United States of America. We send our armies and our navies and our munitions and our tanks and our airplanes and our food. 
Today, when I listened to the wheat appeal and the food appeal, my heart responded, and my country will respond. We'll help in that, of course we shall help in that. And so, half an hour after midnight, the curtain rings down on the first session of the United Nations Assembly, upon which time must pass its inevitable verdict. Given its first temporary home in London, United Nations closes on the voice of Britain's Prime Minister. May I, in conclusion, express the hope that when we meet again, we shall be equally successful, and that we shall see uh, quite clearly then how great has been the achievement of these meetings.